the systems that create these issues are by design, we can have the confidence that we as a collective uh, of people can also redesign them for, for good. And that excites me. That's what keeps me going. This is where it all begins, so say goodbye to all your fears, all your doubts. This is where they die. This is where we come to win, we come to fly. This is where we make our dreams come to life. Welcome to Innovation City. Welcome to Innovation City, a podcast featuring innovators, disruptors, and creators who are breaking through the status quo to change the way business happens today. These are exciting times. My name is Michael Johnson. I'm here with my co-host, Tyler Kelly, and we are super excited to have Dee Nichols with us today. Woo woo. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. You're welcome. We're super excited. So Dee Nichols is a St. Louis-based social practice designer, entrepreneur, and lecturer who mobilizes change makers nationwide to develop creative approaches to the social, civic, and racial justice issues that matter most to them and their community. So my first question, Dee, what in the world is a social practice designer? Yeah. So within the field of design, as well as the field of art, as you know, there are so many disciplines. And social practice within both of these fields is one that is centered solely upon how design, how art, um, how creative practice at large facilitate social change in the address of different social issues. And so even though I'm a communications designer and I work with infographics and video and media and you know digital interfaces and UX design, um, all of it is centered upon responding to um, addressing, mobilizing people as it relates to different issues that we care about. And so a lot of it is with community, but a lot of it is also uh, client based. A lot of it is um, from my own heart and responses to things that I experience in life too. So you talked about you talked about like practically like infographics, just communication in general. Do you have like some specific examples of my own work? Yeah, let's jump. Yeah, let, let's definitely jump into it. Um, Which it's all viral. It's St. <laughs> St. Louis, at least, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, in, in this city, a, a lot of people know about some of the projects that I've been working on. One uh, that is most notable is uh, the Mirror Casket. And as an artist, organizing a team of other creators, uh, performers, designers, uh, even carpenters, etc., to help me bring to life this sculpture that was marched from the space where Mike Brown was murdered in 2014 in Ferguson to the Ferguson Police Department. And the way that we um, actualized that piece in public space in uh, the context of protests and all of these other issues that were going on at the time, uh, that really catapulted um, that work of art or that creation to ultimately be collected by the Smithsonian Museum in DC uh, for its National Museum of African American History and Culture. And for all of us who were a part of that project, that really became um, a, a crux of, of what we do. But in addition to that big one, um, if you've heard of the St. Louis Metro Market, I was the designer uh, behind the first bus that they ever um, implemented. And a part of that meant directing the creative process of gutting out the a metro bus, like a local public transportation bus, and reimagining um, how it can be utilized and designed to bring food uh, and fresh produce back to communities that have been designated as food deserts. So in that case, using design to address uh, food and, and equity and food access. And so there's a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's awesome. I mean, this you do this day in and day out. Yes. So, like, for people that don't, that don't know about the bus project, mm -hmm. you know, like the national audience, kind of t give them a little background. Tell, tell them about that. Yeah. So the St. Louis Metro Market was started by uh, this team of three guys, two who were med school students and one who I actually don't know what he was up to at the, at the time. But I met one of the, the creators um Ironically, at church uh, during the year that the Clinton Global Initiative came to St. Louis. And I was already in um, CGI and just standing on the doorstep of this church, started talking to this med school student about his frustrations with um, 
commuting from like church and where he lived to to Slu's campus and seeing all the dynamics of how people access and don't have access to food. And he had already been exploring uh, this topic, but didn't know how to make it manifest. And so I connected him with my other friend and then they got connected with this third person. And from there, once they had the idea, they brought me back on to, to help design it. And um, that bus is primarily based in Jeff Vanderloo, uh, the 63106 uh, zip code, which is one of uh, the most impoverished or, or like the most challenged uh, zip code in the city. And what they do is use this Metro bus Every Saturday morning, you'll see them popped up at um, one of the fire stations, and they open it up to community members to walk on board, shop, uh, buy you know their their lettuce, their tomatoes, etc. Even some uh, prepared foods and and dishes as well, and then uh, they use part of that part of the proceeds to offer more food education, more food access. Jeremy, Jeremy Goss, one of the creators of that, actually created the Link Market as well, which is this set of uh, storage container grocery stores that are at two of the uh, metro train stops in in the city and now being a part of uh, that effort as well. So, D, take me back to, like, how did you get into all this because you probably didn't, didn't just wake up one day and go I'm going to be a social practice designer there's not at a all long story <laughs> that led up to that yeah in that field even being able to say a social practice designer is something that up until what 2011 wasn't really a thing that wasn't how people define themselves it yeah. was I'm an artist and I care about people and I'm committed to service um But for myself, I I grew up in rural Mississippi, so I'm not from St. Louis. Um, And times were really challenging in in the context of Cleveland, Mississippi. Part of it was an educational thing. Uh, Because I was tested in first grade as a gifted student, I had to go to two schools at the same time. One, because I was smart, uh, and one, because I was black. Because even in the early 90s, schools down there were still segregated. So that experience opened my eyes to a lot of issues as it relates to to race and education and uh, acceptance and inclusion. Um, And that activated me on so many fronts as a local student organizer. But I was always into the arts uh, as early as I can remember. And oftentimes when I would face things like bullying at school or um, see an issue in in my community that frustrated me, I would paint it or draw it. And uh, when it was time to go to college, my mom was like, I love the fact that you like painting and drawing, but you got to do something practical uh, (laughs) for a career. So um, I ended up getting accepted uh, on a full ride to to Wash U. And so that's what brought me here in 2006. And I studied at the Sam Fox School uh, of Design and studied communications design there. But I was also in the Olin Business School and studied marketing. Long story short, I came back and got a master's in social work from WashU as well and studied social entrepreneurship. And the fusion of all of those um, industries, of all of those disciplines, really allowed me to find my niche. And in the midst of undergrad and grad school, I ended up back in rural, uh, in the rural South, but in Alabama of all places. And I don't know if you guys been to Alabama, but just drive it through. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, <laughs> There's it's a lot of trees and small towns. Exactly, um, it's something. There, there are a lot of social challenges that um, people down south, and especially in um, the Tuscaloosa Hill County area of Alabama, are, st- are still facing. And I was accepted into this design fellowship right after undergrad that took me there. And uh, r- maybe three weeks before we arrived, a series of tornadoes had flattened most of the county that we were based in. And so we were, we, we were you know, jumped into the, the deep end very uh, early on in that prog- uh, process. And we failed a lot. We got kicked out of a neighborhood trying to design, uh, redesign basketball backboards and hoops in inside of community parks. But that was the the moment where I realized this is the intersection of all of the stuff that I've studied that I want to be at. I it it sucked to to get kicked out of a neighborhood. It sucked to fail, but 
it was the most enlivening and enlightening uh, experience that I ever had. And I've been on this path ever since. Dig into that a little bit, like mm-hmm. why that intersection is important and maybe like why you actually got kicked out of that neighborhood and what that taught you. Yeah. So in response to why the intersection of design and social change and community progress is, is important, there are so many... Uh, skills and processes that we learn as designers to design things like advertisements and uh, social campaigns for big brands and designing spaces. And a lot of those same methodologies really find value or add value to uh, different social issues that, that we care about. And so being able to approach so many social challenges from a different lens, from a different angle, uh, for for us as designers, gives us a lot of value, of course. But for uh, communities that are impacted, it allows them to not continue to be in the same cycles of trying to find the right policy. Uh, it enables more people to uh, learn and tap into new skills and and sometimes design the solution themselves. Um, so that that is a big relevant part of that that intersection. With that first project, though, my goodness. <laughs> um, so the one, the dynamics of our team was was super intense. Um, I was the only person of color on my team. We were working primarily with a black community that was extremely poor. I was the only person on my team who had ever lived like a chunk, a big chunk of my my life down south, and uh, I was one of two women. There were there was a, a person on our team who was just fascinated with basketball and thought that oh if we can fix fix basketball in this town then everything is gonna be all right and in the midst of installing this one uh, basketball hoop because the the project was called Common Hoops and what we did was take items and materials that were discarded uh, and destroyed or damaged uh, from those tornado storms, we repurposed them to rebuild uh, community parks. And the emphasis was on uh, basketball and the backboards in uh, different parks. And in one of those instances of installing a backboard back into this park, a neighbor, a black neighbor pulled up in his pickup truck and he yelled, like, take that S word (laughs) uh, down. And we complied, um, but then he lectured us about why he was so upset. And it was mainly because we, as young people, primarily a white team, had come into this black neighborhood um, and just imposed this, this creation into their space. And riddled within that were a lot of assumptions. We thought, oh, this basketball pol- bol- uh, ball post that doesn't have a backboard is there because they can't afford it. Um, or th- perhaps the storm knocked it down. And the neighborhood, the neighbors, the residents of that neighborhood had intentionally taken down these backboards because basketball in this context had brought bullying to their neighborhood, a lot of loud noise, a lot of things that they didn't want. So it was a direct insult to put this thing back into their neighborhood. And when this neighbor uh, in the pickup truck turned to me, the only words, or like the first, it definitely wasn't the only words, but the first words that he said to me was, you should know better. And my heart just sunk because he was right. Um, I, I knew that he was speaking to me like black person to black person, like you should of all people should know better. And I made it my my commitment to do better, to learn better. And that's what brought me back to St. Louis for grad school. That's what led me to develop my my first enterprise, uh, Catalyst by Design. That's what has sustained me as uh, a social practice designer um, ever since. And it's interesting because you bring up like a dilemma that a lot of people will face mm-hmm. if they wa- you know if they're trying to impose their value it imposes a, a judge a judge a judge a judging word i don't think that's the word i'm using but it mm-hmm. implies judgment right yeah. so but you know you're going and you're trying to do a better thing and you're you are making certain assumptions so yeah. what did you learn from that experience in turn like that a person in your position could where they're trying to go out and make the world a better place right. 
but they're maybe not considering the effects of their actions. Indeed, yeah. Especially with going to the Brown School of Social Work at WashU and like really studying the dynamics of community engaged work, one of the biggest lessons and takeaways was that it can't just be my idea as a designer or as a creator, or as the person coming in. Um, we, we can't allow ourselves to have this savior complex, like we are going to completely fix this, this issue or fix these people or fix this community. But with understanding the skills, the resources, the connections that we have to offer uh, in the social change space, we have to first listen, first like be a part of community, uh, perhaps work by invitation, um, and from there, co-create, uh, share those resources, but also recognize that in most cases, the people who are most affected by issues, uh, you, you name the issue, the people most affected by it have a wealth of knowledge about how to fix it. And so if we can start to see uh, people as the native experts and not just ourselves as like these highly educated, privileged people, thinkers, innovators, minds, um, we can really start to do less harm as we are enacting social impact, social in innovation, social change. That was the biggest lesson that I ever learned. It, so. it, it takes a lot of humbling, like humbling of self and letting go of like the creator's ego you know yeah totally so you know the mirror casket mm -hmm. obviously that was a huge project Indeed. i mean it for people in st louis it, there was a lot of emotion yeah involved and wrapped up in that but before we get there like in mm -hmm. terms of like involving the community because i i remember like from your tedx talk you said mm -hmm. that you had this idea, but it wasn't something that you could do on your own. Indeed. Yeah, and part of that was partially skill, that I'm not a builder. Um, so as a designer, I'm usually hiring out for people to build the, the thing. Um, and in this case, that didn't feel appropriate, but at the same time, I also didn't want it to just be my thing. Um, and so what I ended up doing was reaching out, I sent like this mass email to as many artists as I knew who were also protesting, also mobilizing and organizing people. And I said, I've been having this nightmare uh, for the last week or so, and I can't shake it. But within it is this same recurring image. Can you help me manifest this? Can you help me get it out of my head? And um, I remember when the first cohort of people first uh, met up with me, I brought in a very rough sketch. It was literally like a pencil drawing of a <laughs> casket and uh, like these strokes that look like glimmers to emphasize reflections and underneath these stick figures. And during that, that conversation, so many ideas started to flow and um, we were able to plug in to all these other events and happenings that were already being organized. And that sense of synergy and good zen, like good karma, good feelings, really led it to be something where I could step back as, you know, the person the the, the person behind the idea and really let others shine. Uh, because in that particular moment, in responding to the fact that Michael Brown, a young black boy, had been uh, shot by a police officer, I know that it wasn't appropriate for me to carry this casket. Um, so when Damon Davis and Marcus Curtis and Derek Laney all found other men to help them carry it, I was like, yes, like, please do that. Um, and as people continue to carry it at other marches and uh, direct actions, I it was great to, to be able to say this thing exists. I'm glad I was able to get out, out of my head, but I'm glad that it is co-owned by all these other people. And so in my TEDx talk, I, I had this map that just kind of showed the, the ripple effect of uh, starting with you know this one person's idea and how that just manifested to this community-based thing, um, but there was also a, a pragmatic part of why I wasn't there in the the first usage of um, this sculpture. 
I was in the hospital and I physically, like I literally could not be there. Um, I'd been rushed to the ER that same day uh, by a coworker because I had fainted at work and long story short, learned that I had very severe anemia and um, I'd been, you know, in the midst of protests, I'd just been running myself dry and not even knowing it and I crashed. Um, and so while all of these community members were uh, activating the mirror casket in, in the midst of this silent march uh, from Mike Brown's uh, murder site to the police department, uh, I was literally hooked up to a hospital bed with EKG strapped to my to my chest, getting three tr blood transfusions. Wow. And that sense of, you know, that entire night, that experience was just like, a very spiritual one for me and I didn't know what would come of that that project but I knew that in that moment I felt proud you know another thing that really caught my attention from the TED talk you mentioned that you didn't go down the first couple of days to the mm -hmm. protest right uh, and when you got down there like you instantly realized that it wasn't like you saw the news not at all tell me about that yeah so my first experience um, in the midst of protests was actually downtown. And there were just tons of people at the arch, young people speaking in the mic, expressing, wailing, crying, etc. And it was daytime. So that wasn't getting as much coverage as what was happening at night. And so I believe it was the next day I had an urban league young professionals meeting. And um, during that meeting, a lot of us were frustrated that um, all of this was happening, but many of us had not gone out yet. And so in business suits, in business casual attire, we all go, well, not all, a lot of us go out there. And when I got there and I, I recorded it, like I, I make YouTube videos. And so I had my camera, I vlogged the, that entire night. And my experience on the other side, you know, of the news media cameras was witnessing people drumming on the side of the street and singing. Um, there, were, there were a lot of people dancing, but like dancing to chants. Um, I remember this one um, moment where there was a guy, I don't necessarily think he was with like the, the protesters, but he, he was in the midst of everyone drinking this huge bottle of beer, uh, like a can of beer. And this woman yell, yelled out to him. She was like, no, like you gotta throw that away because all of those cops across the street, they're gonna see you with that and then they're gonna attack all of us. And she held, she held it down and he, he complied. He threw away his beer uh, and he, he like sat by a tree. And like that moment, I was like, we we are doing something like this is organized. This is not what uh, this is not the chaos that people keep showing on, on TV. And so we stayed out there until about midnight or so, or at least I stayed out there until about midnight, um, mainly because a reporter and a local alderman had been arrested on that night. And so a lot of us were saying, like, hell no, we won't go until you free an Antonio. Like his name was Antonio. And um, a little bit after midnight, that's when this fleet of Humvees uh, just drive right between where we stood in the Andy Worm uh, parking lot and the Ferguson Police Department. And unprovoked, all of the officers started to flash these lights at us. Um, many of them were toting like these guns, like rifles and stuff. And some pointed them, some did not. Um, but they started to, to threaten over the uh, intercom that they had that they will make arrests. And people started yelling back, well, we are on the sidewalk. We have our First Amendment rights. Uh, we're not doing anything wrong. And things escalated from, from there. And on nights that followed, it would be for me at least, it would be that same type of experience where yes, we are protesting. Yes, we are like expressing a demand for, for justice in, in this case. 
and things would go well until about midnight at night and oftentimes it would be a gunshot that would be fired from like far off somewhere else and people would run in that direction and boom next thing you know there's a, a whole new fleet of police officers um in, in cars and in trucks coming down the road uh and chaos would would strike out and so that sense of narrativizing was something that became of deep interest uh for me in the midst of of my own presence out there at a project called faces of the movement that actually took people outside of um the streets and in protest sites and photographed them um atilio uh i can never pronounce his name Di- Diagnostino, he's the he's like an editor with a live magazine, but he's also the lead photog- photographer there. He would bring um, a lot of uh, protesters into his home, uh, which is also one of his studio spaces, and just sit them down and photograph them. And I would be with my camera recording them as they were talking. And we created this this project that just allowed people to share their own story um, and not capture them in the midst of anguish and in the midst of pain but however they want it to to be represented and that project lasted um i believe like eight months following um its launch and then united story like allowing people to share their stories and we partnered with our local npr team uh the nine network and they gave us cameras to just take door to door to people who lived in Canfield. And from those stories, we were able to create this ripple effect of more community members and young people sharing their stories. And we brought them all together in what was called the United Story Summit. And we were able to fund, like through the ticket sales of the summit, uh, fundraise or crowdfund two ideas to come to life. And so for me, as a designer, those types of experiences, I'm always thinking about, well, how can we make how can we create an experience? How can we create an artifact, an object that really allows people to dive more deeply into what they're experiencing in the world, but also find a way to help them innovate? And with FoodSpark now, with the Food Business Incubator, with all of these efforts that we're working on right now, they all serve that purpose. Oh, that's a that's kind of a beautiful thing, like to to take. You're talking about narrative and you're talking about like a narrative that was put out by mainstream media and then just kind of fighting that is just let's get as much of the narrative out there as possible. Let's have everyone's stories be heard. Yes. And that seems like a very beautiful thing. Yeah. And I I don't want to put myself under any pressure, but there have been a lot of uh, inquiry and conversations about bringing that project back and representing different movements and different narratives, um, especially with the rise of the Me Too movement, with the rise of young people really speaking up out about uh, mass shootings and, and school shootings, um, but also the continuation of fighting against police brutality and fighting against the water crisis in Flint, Michigan, like all of these movements um, and communities of people who have something to say what are the the central platforms that allow all of those to shine at once? So would you say that that's kind of like the theme of what you try to accomplish in in your work is let's get those let's get stories out that are being heard? Yes, not not only stories though. Let's also get ideas out there that aren't being activated yet. Um, let's let's find a way to use what my team calls common cultural denominators. Uh, to do things differently, to create differently. And how we define common cultural denominators are those things that despite our differences, every single person has to, to experience. The fact that every single person has to eat. So how can we use food uh, to, to create space or create ideas that serve a, a higher purpose? We do that through Food Spark, our, which is one of our initiatives. Um, storytelling, every single person has a story to tell. And how, we, we also believe that like, there is data, there, is, there are solutions in the stories that we tell. And if we can help each other find those and tap into it, then boom, we can do something differently. We can take a pivot um, in, in the world. Same with art, same with public space, all of these things that everyone experiences day to day. So talk to me about 
the end goal. I mean, I know that just part of being human is is transformation, is transition. Mm-hmm. So there's a point A, there's a point B, there's a place where we're going, right? Yeah. There's a journey. But tell me about like your work and your vision and what the world looks like five years from now, 10 years from now, or even better yet, like what the world looks like when you've actually accomplished what you set out to do. Yeah. Here's, here's my vision. And I, I think about this a lot because right now futurism is such at the heart of um, different parts of our culture, thinking about Afrofuturism, transfuturism. Um, and for me, part of that future, part of my vision is that through the things that we create, co-create uh, with communities, people can live a more dignified life where they are not targeted, they are not profiled, they are not harmed for being whoever they naturally are. And every single person would have the, the access, the resources, and the, the tools necessary to do whatever it is they feel called and, and passionate to, to do and actualize in the world. I think that if I can help as many people do those two things and feel welcomed and supported within the communities and contexts in which they live, then I would have done my part. Um, but it, it takes way more than me you know it takes more than one entity it takes really mobilizing other people to to own that to own that desire plus many more um and find alignment with saying that if if we can all live dignified lives where we are supported as our fullest selves and have the ability to create the most positive and brilliant uh, things that that we that we want to that we desire to then from there I think we can start to solve a lot of the issues that continue to plague us and this is the first time I ever heard of a social practice designer but I uh-huh. love it <laughs> <laughs> and I and I would imagine that there's like let's just say like 10,000 people out there that mm-hmm. potentially have like a calling if you will like a desire to do the type of work that you're doing. How do they get started? Like, like what do they need to do to get from point A to point B? Yeah. So there, there definitely are a lot of us. Um, more and more people are really finding their, their niche with a design lens in, in the mist. Um, to get started in this type of work or this part of the work, there are a lot of resources. There are entities like IDEO.org, um, the Acumen Foundation or Acumen Plus that teach these skills of human-centered design practice, design thinking, um, that anyone and everyone can and should, in my opinion, uh, pursue. Beyond getting that training and learning those skills, part of it is starting wherever you are. Um, Working in our backyards is the the easiest way to to get started and really allow that ripple effect um, to to take place. Uh, For me, I started in the context of the rural South where I grew up. That brought me back to St. Louis. I was able to do a lot of great work here. And now I'm on a national scale. And in August, I I will be able to officially say that I have international projects, which is awesome. Awesome. But... um, being able to to see that ripple effect over time has really deepened my understanding of of the practice. So I I would encourage people to to kind of like take that that route. Uh, but everyone doesn't have that type of patience or timeline. Okay. Uh, so there there's a growing number of um, career opportunities where you can uh, become a design thinker, a design strategist, a design researcher at uh, not only different firms across the nation, but also different nonprofits. Um, finally, I, I would say, in its heart, there's this belief that everyone is a designer. Everyone can influence how human behavior um, is influenced by the way things are set up in a space, by the way things look, by the way things are uh, communicated. And being able to make 
those small ripples um, can happen in your everyday life as well. I love the way you frame design as you didn't say it like this, but I, I interpret it as the intersection of art and life because for a lot of people, when they think of art, it's something that's like outside of the everyday. Yeah, it's removed and from them. Removed, yeah. And so now, like the way you describe it, it's much more human centric and yes. everyday and real. Yes. I love that. Highly integrated across anything that we experience and everything that we touch. Um, everything, in my opinion, is, is by design. Um, and I, I can get very meta <laughs> uh, <laughs> with that, but the ways that we consume the things that we know has been designed for us by different systems, um, but also different practitioners um, on, on an everyday level. And so because with that knowledge that the systems that create these issues are by design, we can have the confidence that we as a collective uh, of people can also redesign them for, for good and redesign them for, for the for the best intentions uh, possible. And that excites me. That's what keeps me going. That that simple um, point of optimism that we can redesign this. Um, I don't know. I, I don't have any qualms about that. You know. Yeah, that's that's a beautiful that's a beautiful thought because it it makes everything seem possible. Indeed, it is. It keeps me from it. freaking out about <laughs> the current state of the world. That's for sure. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that whether you're a social innovator or a designer or an entrepreneur or not, if we, if we lose our optimism, if we lose our belief that anything and everything is possible and that we can influence that po those possibilities, I think that is when, that's when we lose, um, but until then, if we can keep creating and, and stay uh, committed to making life, uh, whatever realm of it we're in, better, then I, I think we don't have to lose hope. Last question, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. so, so the people that are listening to that, that aren't familiar with St. Louis, but what they, what they are familiar with is what they saw on the news, uh -huh. which even though it wasn't the way that they framed it, mm -hmm. like there was still like, it was heavy for a long time. And we're still kind of working out of we that, are. right? So for people in a situation that's heavy, mm -hmm. how do they maintain that hopeful outlook? Produce, create. Um, that's really all I, all I have. I, I think that, you know the phrase, nothing changes until, nothing changes if nothing changes. Um, we have to more and more create um, those possibilities find a way to bring new ideas, new perspe uh, perspectives uh, into, into the world, allow more connections to be made between people, especially people who are different and live different lives. Um, because part of what makes the, the heaviness, heaviness happen is that so many people don't know what they don't know or can't see the, the beauty and brilliance in, in others. And um, if we can all find a way to, to tweak that, even with our next door neighbor or our, our uncle or our family members, um, that, that is a step. But I also think in terms of saying create and produce, I also mean create those spaces for yourself. Um, find the, the things that, that fuels you um, and not only consume that stuff, but learn how to produce that. Um, like, like I said earlier, I'm a aspiring YouTuber, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which is such a is such a big field right now. Uh, there are so many content creators, but one of my my favorite ones is a woman by the name of Lily Singh, and Lily goes by Superwoman on the internet. And when she talks about her story, she always talks about how. She was in such a deep state of depression when she first started making videos. And she realized that it was the video, it was like the creation process that made her feel better. That became her therapy. Wow. And um, that 
like her sharing that story has resonated with so many people where YouTube is just full of content creators, uh, people who are just finding ways to center the things that they love the most um, in their lives and create the spaces, the experiences that they want. And I, I really, I really stick with that. That's awesome. D, thank you. Yeah, thank you guys for Th- having this me. This has just been like amazing. Yeah, like this that. is this there, has been an amazing. There's no amazing other words. Time. D, where can we find you at online? Where should people go to find your stuff or find YouTube you? channel, yes. all that good stuff? Um, there are so many places. So, of course, go to dnichols.co, not com. Uh, that's d e n i c h o l s dot c o, and you can see all of my work. Uh, watch a lot of the talks that I've given across the nation. Um, in addition to my personal site. There's also a Facebook page uh, for for the fans. <laughs> um, and that's also facebook.com slash dnicholsco. Uh, I'm on Twitter and Instagram as D-E underscore Nichols. And, of course, YouTube um, and LinkedIn. So here's the thing. <laughs> of, all, of all social media platforms, LinkedIn is – that's the one where I have reached pro levels. Wow. Um, almost what 5,000 followers there and that's a pro um, yeah and <laughs> I don't know how how it works but people really um, resonate with the content that I post there so find me on LinkedIn as well thank you for listening D thanks again yeah thank you all again for having me this has definitely been a joy Innovation City for more episodes visit innovationcity.co be sure to subscribe rate and review And if you're in St. Louis, visit us on a Thursday night. Details at vincafstl.org. And connect with us on social at We Are Slam or at Venture Cafe STL. Thanks for listening. This is where it all begins. So say goodbye to all your fears, all your doubts. This is where they die. This is where we come to win. We come to fight. This is where we make our dreams.